as promised, I'm here to answer your questions. For celebrating my 1000 subscribers on YouTube, I asked you to send me your questions and um, I said I would answer them in a little, little Q&A video. So let's get started. Uh, Gerald asked, what are the instruments you play except fiddle and nickel harpa and how did you learn to play them? So yeah, fiddle and nickel harpa are my two main instruments. I started with fiddle and violin, actually classical violin, and I didn't really learn any other instrument up until the point when I started nickel harpa. I did sing a lot though when I was a child and I still do now. I, I'm no professional singer but I really like singing. I like different styles. I've been singing a lot of classical when I was a child. Um, I loved opera when I was a child. And nowadays more folk, like Celtic folk during a long time during my teenage and now mostly Swedish folk, Norwegian folk and tunes from a bit everywhere, basically. I wish to incorporate singing a little more in my music, in my practice also, but I'm very not confident about that, so I'm really taking baby steps about that. And I have started recently to play hurdy-gurdy as well, so that was a long-term, long-time dream of mine actually, to play hurdy-gurdy. Before Nikol Harpa I had discovered hurdy-gurdy and I wanted to play it. But I didn't find an instrument and then I crossed the path of Nikol Harpa and Nikol Harpa took over <laughs> all other instruments except fiddle, basically. Um, but now I have actually got a Nikol Harpa, uh, got a hurdy-gurdy, sorry, and I am slowly learning to play it. I am by no means trying to become a professional on, on hurdy-gurdy. It feels like way too complex and too different from my main instruments and I want to stay focused on uh, fiddle and Nikol Harpa. But I really like the sound of this instrument and yeah, I'm learning slowly. Otherwise, I mean, there are many instruments that I can't play, that's mostly it. What I would like to play are percussions, especially DAF. I really, really like DAF. And uh, also military drums, I really like that. And uh, tambourine, this kind of like smaller frame drums in general, I like that and uh, I would like to play cello. That's like the instrument I would really like to learn to play or viola da gamba or both. I don't know yet, but I love both these instruments. We have Robert Le Diable, very, very nice uh, name by the way, who is asking, are you interested in other styles of music for fiddle, such as Irish, Italian from Regia Valley, and the typical French bourré d'Auvergne and Rigodon du Dauphiné? So yes, I am definitely interested by other types of fiddle music uh, than Scandinavian. Scandinavia is my main focus about folk music, but Irish, Celtic in general, definitely. I really like Scottish music as well. I'm uh, sometimes having courses with Kevin Henderson, who is from the Shetland Islands, and I really like that repertoire as well. And I really like bluegrass music and um, American all time as well. So I like also American folk music on fiddle. It's not my main focus, it's not repertoires I really want to explore very much in depth, but I like them. And actually I discovered Celtic music and Irish music especially way before Scandinavian music and I loved it for many years. So yes, it's definitely something, something that I'm interested in. Uh, Italian music, I have seriously no idea how it sounds like, so I can't tell, but maybe. Uh, French, French, <laughs> French, Bourré d'Auvergne. Um, is a repertoire I definitely like. So yes, I'm playing a little bit of bourrées, like traditional bourrées. I'm wanting to dig more into that stuff because I like it. Um, I'm not going often in France at all, so it's a bit hard to learn when you're not in the place. But I definitely like bourrées d'Auvergne, yes, absolutely. But Rigodon du Dauphiné, not that much. I've heard a couple of Rigodons and it's a lot of major keys and I don't really like major keys that much. Depends how, but it's not really my thing. But Bourré d'Auvergne, yeah, an Italian, maybe, I don't know. What I'm more interested in uh, about fiddle music especially would be like Balkan music, Eastern Europe. So Bulgarian, Romanian, this kind of stuff. This is more what I like, Hungarian and so on. So more this than Southern, Western Europe, more like Eastern Europe, more mostly. 
Another question is from Tom Glastonbury, who is one of my, one of my patrons on, on pa Patreon. Uh, what was your musical journey to Scandi folk music? Who were your teachers? Where did you study? So I started with classical violin in Geneva. First in a private school, well, in two private schools, but with the same teacher, like he moved school and his name was Raffaello Giambrini, so an Italian man, and I started when I was four, and I stayed with him for 11 years. And um, I was interested in many different styles of music, but I was mostly playing classical music with him. And he was trying to make me play romantic classical music, and I didn't like it. I always wanted to play Baroque, especially Vivaldi and Bach. Uh, so yeah, that was always a fight between us. And um, I loved Bach since I was four, kind of, since I started, I wanted to play that. And I loved Corelli, Corelli as well. So um, La Folia and the Viola da Gamba sonatas and yeah, Baroque, early Baroque and Baroque. That's really my stuff. And then I changed teacher. I went with uh, Bianca Mihaias Faves, who was an amazing teacher. And I stayed with her, I don't remember how long, but quite many years and she was amazing as well she was playing a lot of Kletzmer uh, as uh, along classical music so she was also giving me more folk music and we were doing also like uh, movie music so soundtracks and I really liked that she had a very varied approach uh, approach to music and she knew a lot about many different subjects so it was really interesting to study with her and along that that was when I was a teenager and along that I was starting to play Irish music on my own. So I was listening to Irish music and singing it, mm -hmm, humming it and starting to try to play it on the fiddle. And then I this, so I, I thought actually that folk music was only found in Ireland. I don't know why, but I had this conception that this kind of folk music jam sessions where you gather with other players and you play until you fall asleep kind of, or you're totally drunk or something. <laughs> For me, in my head, that was only in Ireland, and I wanted to go to Ireland so bad because of that. And I started being interested in medieval music as well, and playing that on the fiddle. And then, by many, many different weird uh, series of events, I met Nicole Harpa, thanks to my friend Aina. I discovered Swedish folk music at the same time as Nicole Harpa, and I was like, gosh, this music does exist! I was so excited because I loved Celtic music, but Scandinavian music is a little bit darker. At least it feels to me that Celtic music is a bit like more joyful. Not the songs, I mean the reels and so on. And Scandinavian music is a little bit calmer in rhythm and a little bit darker in the harmonies. Not everywhere, they are also very joyful things. But it felt a little closer to... Well, not a little closer, but it felt totally close to my heart and to what I wanted to play. And Norwegian music is very sunlight it feels to me very much sunlight like howling especially like a lot of Lydian mode and this also was talking to my heart actually before I discovered Scandinavian music I was already listening to my favorite band ever Yalla Horn but I I thought it was just that band that was playing this kind of music I didn't realize that they were part of a world like a scene of music for me it was just their music and they were awesome and that was it and then I realized that they were actually part of the Scandinavian folk music. <laughs> so, yeah, I had conceptions when I was a teenager and I don't know where they come from, they came from, but they were quite wrong or partially wrong, wrong many of them. Okay, so now I just have to add one little chapter that I actually totally forgot to talk about when I was recording the video. <laughs> Shame on me, it was already too long, but I still forgot an important part. When I had discovered Nicole Harpa, I played it a little bit on my own. Uh, just like adapting from the fiddle and taking a few courses here and there, mostly in France with people who are get, gravitating around Jean-Claude Condé, the French Nicolas builder. Uh, but as soon as I had the opportunity, I went to Eric Salström Institute uh, in Turbo, close to Uppsala. And because I had heard about this place uh, in France, and it felt like this is the place to be if you want to learn Nicole Harpa. So I went there and I started study. And there I had the teachers, very, very good teachers. I had Olof Johansson, I had Niklas Rosvall, I had Mia Marin on fiddle, I had Ditte Andersson, Sonja Salström, and many guest teachers as well, especially Marcus Svensson, David Eriksson. 
mostly those Andesnorde, a couple more. Uh, sorry if I forget some, but mostly those were the teachers there. And uh, so I felt that I had only touched the very start, like the very beginning of Scandinavian folk music and I definitely wanted more. And so I decided to stay one more year in Sweden and I went to Bolnes Folkhögskola, which is in Helsingland. And it was nice there and the teachers were absolutely amazing. They were um, Johanna Bölja Hetzberg and Leif Ottosson, great, and Linnea Alcombell. And I really loved them all, but the school was went much more focused on classical and jazz music. So the folk music course, we were very few people, we were just four, if I remember correctly. And I felt that this was too little for me to really get like inspiration. Although the teachers were amazing, I needed more colleagues in a way. So I decided to switch to Molung Folkhögskola in Dalarna where my previous teacher Mia Marin was teaching and I knew that with her I would get like all the stuff I needed and also one of my friends was there and she told me that they were like 15 in the in the classroom or something and I felt okay I need to switch to go there so I went to Molung Folkhögskola after one month of Bolnes and in Molung I had Mia as said and I had Patrick Andersson whom I didn't know uh, yet at the moment, but he became one of my absolutely favorite teachers. I really, really love his playing and I like the guy as well. Um, and we had also many great guest teachers. We had some of the Smedia tradition. So Per Joslaj, so Lars Halvarsson, um, Kalle Almlöf, Anders Almlöf. And we also had guest teachers such as Kjell-Erik Eriksson and uh, Anders Lövberg. So many great, great people came and taught there. Since then, I've been taking a few lessons with uh, Adrian Jonas, who's been one of my favorite players for a long, long time. And uh, that's pretty much it. I didn't take many lessons again after that because I'm not going to Sweden very often. Then there is Anne B who is asking, now that Kneep is over, what are your projects? A uh, very good question. Yes, Knip, my duo is over and I have many projects, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna manage all of them. So uh, my main project at the moment, you might have seen a couple of videos of mine passing by. This is called Sval. It's a trio, but for now we play just as two duos because we don't manage to organize. <laughs> I'm gonna explain why. Um, so one of the other people of the trio is Sarah Buffler and she's from Alsace in France, so Eastern France, so she's not too far away from me, so we manage to meet kind of often. Still it's a little bit of distance, but it's not too far away. And the other one is Sylvain Poul, absolutely amazing guitar player, and he lives in southern France, so that's why, and I live in Switzerland, so it's a little bit difficult to organize like all the trips and everything. So for now I've played with Sarah and with Sylvain, but we have not managed to play as a trio, which we really want to do, but it hasn't worked out yet. So with Sarah, when we play just as a duo, it's Sval Harps. And when I play just with Silva, it's Sval Duo. And all three together, which will happen, I hope, soon, is Sval. So this is my Balfolk project. So it's a bit of a mix between Scandinavian folk music and Balfolk music. We play a bit of bourré, a bit of cercle circassien, a bit of jigs, a bit of Scottish and a bit of Polska and a bit of Halling. So we mix a bit half-half kind of. And then my, my other main focus is to play solo because I want to play solo for dancing and for concerts more. And I realize that I want to have a sound that is more varied than just fiddle or just nickel harpa. I mean, there's nothing wrong in having a dance evening with just one fiddle or just one nickel harpa and I'm already switching between the two so it's already varied but I want to vary a little more so I have many ideas about that uh, that's where the singing comes in as well I want to sing sometimes I don't want to be a singer I just want to sing a couple of tunes to change the kind of sound I give and I have other projects as well but this is a big thing and I'm absolutely not sure I'm gonna manage to build it because it's it's implying building some machine 
and adding that to my playing. So that's a bit my crazy crazy project at the moment and I have no idea if I'm gonna manage so I'm not saying more about that but that's part of the solo playing if it works out. And the big thing is that I would love to have another duo especially with guitar or cello would be great or with clarinet or bass clarinet I would or percussions that I would like another duo again and the thing is that I am moving my whole life maybe you have seen that already I am moving to Sweden again during the summer so I'm gonna move this summer so I can't just start a new project so I'm waiting and that's also why I want to develop my solo playing I am waiting up until the time when I'm settled somewhere in Sweden and then I can start looking for other musicians to have another project which I, which I really really hope I will have because I really want to have something new and fresh. I'm very excited by Sval already and I feel so much wanting more new stuff to happen. So uh, now let's move on to the topic of some advices for other people. Tido um, Siatsema, I don't know how to pronounce that, Siatsema, asks uh, how to make interesting arrangements for multiple instruments from simple folk tunes. That's an extremely good question and this is all the work of arranging. So actually this is something that I might cover in a full video so I'm not gonna answer this question now also it's just way too big as a topic but yeah simple folk tunes how to make them into something interesting that will be a video definitely. Then we have Nathaniel Brown from rural USA. I like this precision. Um, what are your advice for people trying to learn Nordic folk music in other parts of the world? Mm, it's not easy to play Scandinavian folk music when you live in another part of the world. That's why my videos are there. <laughs> I noticed that there is a lack of information, especially if you don't speak any Scandinavian language. So that's what I'm trying to provide to you people who are across the world and who would like to play more Scandinavian music or and or Nikka Harpa. And my advice in general, I have already talked about that, but my advice in general is to try to find other people in your region. Like, even if they don't play exactly the same style or even if they are not the same level of, as you or even if it's a little bit far away or something, but find, find friends, spiel kompisar, playing friends because you really like you will enrich each other even if they are beginners even if you are a beginner not doesn't matter you will en enrich each other by that also we are very lucky nowadays that there is internet and well look for stuff on the internet look for videos uh, cover bands Scandinavian bands that you like take tunes from them buy CDs when you can and when there is a concert of Scandinavian music in your area or a workshop just go there like priority number one you go there yeah and support your local events that's pretty much yeah my advice is also if you see that there are some bands coming in your region or yeah touring in general internationally such as Vesen for example or the Nordic Fiddlers Block if they're not coming to your region, try to contact them and try to organize an event with them. Because, I mean, they will be very happy if you offer them a place to play and, and or teach and sleep. If you organize something for them, that's great for them. And for you, it's very good. So you just have to gather a, a group of people who are interested about them coming and then you organize something. That's, that's great if you can do that. Another question. Common mistakes, what are the common mistakes to avoid when learning Scandi tunes? That's from Xatnu Rowan from the UK. I'm sorry if you, I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, yeah, there are many common mistakes to avoid when you're starting Scandinavian folk music. I think the main one is, as with everything, every nerdy topic, don't think that it's simple. <laughs> Don't think that when you have learned that you already know the whole topic. I mean, we all make this mistake. We start to discover the, um, the new topic and at first we are just like, oh, this is great. And when we have learned four tunes or something or five, we just start thinking, <coughs> okay, I know that stuff. And <laughs> this is extremely wrong and I've been there as everyone. And then you start realizing that 
oh no, there is much more to that than what I thought. So I would say when you start playing Scandinavian folk music and you have played, I don't know, some polskas and some slang polskas, don't think that now you know what the difference is because it's it's very subtle, it's very complex, there are many different types of tunes, there are many people who have different ideas as well about that and there is no absolute truth. So stay very humble and very open-minded and listen to everyone but make up your own mind that's what i would say um also when you learn scandinavian tunes one mistake that i would say is never learn only from sheet music that i'm absolutely absolutely saying that all the time but folk music is music that is transmitted by ear so if you are not comfortable learning only by ear, I totally understand. I think you should develop your ear to be able to learn tunes by ear, but if you're not comfortable, definitely use sheet music. That There is no shame in that. But don't rely only on sheet music to learn Scandinavian tunes. Especially Scandinavian tunes, because there are many rhythms that cannot be written down. If you try to play Finskogspols, you will understand what I mean and also short first beat polskas and many different things cannot be written on sheet music so don't learn Swedish folk music or Norwegian or Scandinavian folk music in general only from paper um, if you learn it from paper that's fine but try to find a recording or a video at least one so at least you have it a little bit in your ear because it might be extremely different from what is written on paper and also one last one, especially if you're playing an instrument that is in tune, so piano, accordion, uh, harp, like all the instruments that cannot play blue notes. Remember that there are many, many blue notes in Scandinavian folk music, and even if you cannot play them, and maybe you don't hear them that much because you are used to your own instrument, remember that they exist and when you play together with a flute, a violin or something or even in a carpa, it's kind of possible to play blue notes some of them sometimes remember that they might play with blue notes and that they are not playing out of tune it's just blue notes that you cannot play because your instrument is in tune all the time so I think that's that's also something to keep in mind uh, also yeah no one one more Try to learn as many informations about the tune you're learning as you can. So try to not just play a Polska or a Polska from southern Sweden. This is highly imprecise. Try to at least have one name. Sometimes there are many for a tune, many informations, but try to have at least one name. Like the village where it's from or the region, but like as small as possible or one person you know it after you know it from like after um, and the more of these informations you have the better it is so I highly suggest that you really really try to have a list of informations for each tune you learn not just Polska I personally have a big big Excel spreadsheet with like type of tune where it's from region village um, particularities, keys in which it's played, usually, like the tuning in which it's probably played, sometimes I know, sometimes I'm just guessing, and uh, who I have it from, when did I learn it, I have a big spreadsheet, I'm, I'm a nerd, <laughs> I'm a total nerd, but I have this huge spreadsheet with like all the possible informations I have, and are there second voices, written by whom, and all that. I'm not saying that you should have that, but maybe have at least a little booklet in which you write as many informations as possible, or if you learn from sheet music or if you have sheet music to remember the tunes, just write who you have it from. Also, who you learn it from. Do you learn it from a video on YouTube? Do you learn it from a friend of yours? Do you learn it from a workshop you went to? Like, write all that down. Gather information, don't lose it. I think that's very, very important. So now I'm gonna go to uh, questions about language, languages and it's just about me basically <laughs> um, Gerald again is asking how did you learn to speak Swedish and how don't you forget it as you're not living in Sweden so I learned Swedish on the spot when I was in Sweden I didn't take any lessons but I've learned 
German and English and my mother tongue is French um, before I learned Swedish and I think those three languages are the ones that you need to learn Swedish on your own and it's I think it's really like for anything that you want to learn but especially languages it's just trying and agreeing to make mistakes I was saying shit all the time and very often I had people looking at me like Hey, what is she saying? Because I was using the wrong verb or something. And my grammar is kind of poor, <laughs> actually. I've worked on it a little bit with the grammar book, but, well, it's not very good. Adding a little precision here, I don't think that you need to speak English, German and French before you learn Swedish to be able to speak Swedish. But I think that those three languages helped me a lot because, well, Swedish is a Germanic language, so German is obviously a good language to already know, I mean, any other Germanic language, so Dutch, for example, would help as well. Uh, English is close to Swedish in terms of grammar, I felt like there are many little things in the grammar that felt similar to me, although they are not that close. And French is also useful because you have lots of French words, actually, in Swedish. So very often when I don't know a Swedish word, I just say it in French and usually kind of works out. <laughs> so yeah. And I have to add a little part that the camera cut because there was no space left on the memory card. <laughs> and this is how I'm keeping my Swedish while I'm not in, living in Sweden anymore. And I do that by talking with Swedish friends. So I have a couple of Swedish friends uh, here in Switzerland uh, from Sweden or people who just speak Swedish. So we speak Swedish together a lot. And I also have contact with several friends in Sweden, so we write in Swedish and when we call it's also in Swedish. And I go to Sweden not very often, maybe once a year. And every time I'm just like practicing as much as I can. I always have a little booklet with me that I write new vocabulary in. I try to be consistent on that. And I'm also listening to a bit of videos and radio programs in Swedish, but I should do that way more actually. I'm a bit lazy on that. It's so e so much easier to find stuff in English than in Swedish. So yeah, I have a tendency to just listen to English more. But I'm reading stuff in Swedish, so on the internet, but also some books. I'm just reading Astrid Lindgren's books, but also more uh, advanced books now and it's really helping me improve my vocabulary and my grammar. So another question of Dirold was do you speak any other languages except English, French and Swedish? Uh, yes I do a little bit so for people who don't know first my mother tongue is French and I've learned English in school and so I learned Swedish in Sweden but in school I've also learned German so yeah, I kind of speak German, but... Well, I'm supposed to speak German, but I'm very uncomfortable with it because I've learned it in school and I had to do, not to do any mistakes, not say anything stupid, do my grammar perfectly. And seriously, German grammar is a nightmare. It's like they've taken every possible difficulty that you can find in European languages and they've put it into the German grammar. Just why? <laughs> it's really hard and at least I think so. I know French is probably hard as well, but it's my mother tongue, so I don't realize it. But German grammar is awful and I really like the language and I would really like to be able to speak it for real. But, well, I kind of have a block in my in my brain. When I start to speak German, I just freeze as soon as I'm saying anything that I know is wrong or even worse if someone tells me that I'm saying something wrong or the worst is if someone laughs at me because I'm saying something stupid and this is totally okay for me in Swedish I'm totally used to that and I'm fine if people laugh at me and if I'm saying stupid things but in German I can't like I freeze and I get very very bad like I feel super bad when I say something wrong and I think it's because of the school and I had very bad teachers, actually. The teaching of German in Switzerland is really not good. And I, I think that's why I feel uncomfortable. I have actually a couple of German friends and I've tried to speak German with them, but usually we just don't. We speak English. I can speak German when I'm forced to do, or when I'm very tired, so I don't care anymore. But usually you will not hear me speak German by choice, although I would really like to be able to. On my list is 
one Slavic language. I don't know which one yet, but I think it's gonna be Russian, just very simply. But I really want to learn a Slavic language. But Swedish first, <laughs> so that's it. And I would love to learn Danish and nor proper Norwegian and Icelandic. And I would like to learn an Inuit uh, language as well and Sami. Many plans. I don't know which ones I'm gonna, I'm gonna manage to <laughs> complete, we'll see. So that's for this video. Lots of doubling. It was nice talking to you. I'm getting cold a bit now. It's still March, so it's pretty cold here in the mountains. I hope you liked it. Thank you a lot for your questions. I hope I answered to all of them, except the ones I'm gonna make videos out of. And uh, thank you very much for subscribing to the channel. If you haven't done it already, please consider doing it. It's really helping. It's just numbers, but it's really helping me. And also, if you like my content, usually I play music. Uh, you can support me on Patreon, link on the video, on the screen, at the end of the video. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, and the regular videos are going on very soon, as soon as I have time. Bye! Hey, Dwarf! <laughs>